Uh, hello everyone, I hope you're all keeping well. So uh, I'm just going to give you a brief recap on why we're delivering the project and show you some of the great progress photographs about show you how we're getting on uh, with the scheme. So in terms of the highways issues, the, the existing traffic signals in the central little had, had them, they operate under a, a four separate phases and this can take around five minutes to complete a cycle which causes significant delays along this sort of key east-west route across Hertfordshire. Now with traffic predicted to increase, albeit that traffic numbers are down currently during this COVID pandemic, but you know, volumes are predicted to increase. HC and its partners are committed to improving strategic infrastructure, which will support future economic growth, including houses and jobs. Um, this project will also support the delivery of the East Hearts local plan. And this key sort of highways element of the scheme will aim to reduce journey times along the A120, but also reduce severance in the centre of Little, ha Little Haddam, which will improve the quality of life for the local community. Uh, alongside the, the, the highways issues, there's also the issue of flooding, uh, and the community has experienced extensive flooding over the years, um, six events between 1947 and 2014. There are 72 properties are, that are at risk from flooding in the village um, and some of them properties become at risk at what we call a one in 20 event. So a sort of 20% chance, annual chance of an event. Um, and since the inception of the scheme, we've been working closely with the Environment Agency to deliver a combined highways and flood alleviation scheme, which will aim to reduce the risk of river flooding in Little Haddam and communities to the south. So I think that this project is, is also a great example of collaboration and we've secured funding for the project from multiple sources. Now, traditionally funding for a project such as this would come from the DFT via a business case, and that would really focus around sort of journey time savings as a primary benefit. Um, and a large portion of the funding has been secured from the DFT, but also we've been working closely with Hertfordshire LEP, and we also consider wider benefits to promote growth such as housing and jobs. Um, we've also worked with the environment, environment agencies, as I said, which have secured funding to deliver the flood alleviation elements of the scheme. And these would have been sort of unaffordable on their own without the use of um, dual use embankments, which we've got on this project, which I'll show you later on. Um, and I think at this point, I'd also like to acknowledge our extended project family of all, of all contributed to the delivery of the scheme, including colleagues from WSP Arup, Graham Construction and various HC departments and of course Cotswold Archaeology who are presented today and have been with us from early on in the project. And finally, not forgetting the political support that we need to deliver a major project such as this. So bringing ourselves to the scheme itself, it's a four kilometre single carriageway bypass to the north of Little Haddam village. It has three flood alleviation elements to the scheme, the River Ash flood storage area, Orbit Tributary flood storage area, the Lloyd Taylor drain diversion to the south of the village. Uh, work started in July 2019 and Graham Construction and their site team have been working hard to deliver the project despite the challenges that we have faced associated with COVID-19. Although there has been some delay to the programme, we are hoping to complete the scheme next summer in 2021. And I'm now going to run through some of the photos that show the great progress that we've made on site since we started. So this photo you can see is a shot of Tile Kiln Roundabout at the western tie-in for the scheme. You'll be able to see the main site compound which Graham Construction have set up on this parcel of land here. The roundabout itself has a, a separate segregated left turn lane which you can see here which will take traffic eastbound straight onto the bypass and this will lead us through the countryside um, to River Ash Flood Storage Area and further on to Albury Road bridge. At Albury Tributary, this is the first of our flood alleviation elements of the scheme. Um, effectively, these flood storage areas work like your bathroom sink. So we have a culvert which goes under the, the centre of the embankment, which is effectively always open and will allow a certain amount of water to flow through at a steady rate. Once the water builds up behind the, the embankment itself, it gets to a certain point uh, in a one in a hundred year storm event where it will overflow down a spillway which will return to the river on the inside of the bypass and as you can see from this photo the the embankment to the east of this is starting to take shape 
on this side, the water course is actually diverted round here and will come through the culvert. Moving further round, we have Albury Road Overbridge, which is a, a three span integral bridge. So this means that it doesn't have any joints or bridge bearings, which will ultimately mean, mean lower maintenance costs for HCC. The bridge itself opened to traffic in June, 29th of June was a key project milestone. And we're currently just waiting for British Telecom to do some final uh, diversions, which will mean we can get the this plug of earth removed and effectively join the, the main line all the way through the scheme for the first time since we started. If I move on round, we now come to the River Ash flood storage area, which is the second largest um, flood alleviation element of the scheme, or sorry, the largest flood alleviation element of the scheme, and it's the most significant structure on the scheme. And when it's full in a one in a hundred year storm event, the floodwaters would extend about a mile north across farmland. So you can see it's quite, quite an extensive area, and I'm not sure I'll ever see that myself. But that is, a, say, a one in a hundred year event storm. Um, to the south of the embankment, you can see two of our balancing drainage basin balancing ponds, which form part of our sustainable drainage system. And this will allow highway runoff to be returned to the river at the, the same rate and quality as any water that would have come off the fields separately. Um, you can also see a photo down here to the bottom left. We've actually had some of our local duck population making use of one of the drainage basins already on this, uh, this location. Um, this is River Ash Spillway and Overbridge. That's the largest structure on the project and it incorporates a significant amount of reinforced concrete, as you can sort of see in that photo there. And it will have a U trough, which will be constructed with the overbridge for the road that will take the road across this alignment. Um, and yeah, this this was the first spillway uh, slab being poured the other day, so that's coming on nicely. This is just a view across the River Ash embankment looking up to Mill Mound cutting. Um, you'll see on the right we've got a, a parcel of land here which was severed when we purchased the land for the bypass, and we've used that to turn into a wildflower meadow, and that's where a lot of our Roman snails have been translocated to. So again, part of the ecology works on the project. Again, another view of Mill Mound cutting. So this is leading up to Mill Mound, the, the scheduled ancient monument at the top of the hill there. And we've got a new bridge being constructed, which is Mill Mound Overbridge, which will take uh, provide agricultural access and take the bride away over the bypass. And this is the, the start of the construction for that overbridge. And then moving further around towards the end of the scheme, we have Haddon Park underpass, which will provide again an agricultural route under the bypass and bright, carry the bride away as well. Um, now to the east of this location, we have a rare species of barber steel bat living in the adjacent woodland, and they used to have a, a foraging route along this alignment. So we know that bats um, use an existing underpass to the east of the Haddon Park roundabout location, which uh, I think was covered on a BBC One Show article last year. Um, and when we finish this, we'll have the, the approach ropes to the underpass will actually actually have hedgerow lining them to guide the bats under the bypass. That's part another part of our um, environmental mitigation. And finally, the final progress photograph is of um, the final element of the flood alleviation scheme, which is the Lloyd Taylor drain water course diversion. So the existing water course travels down here and goes through back gardens and, and under houses in culverts and pipes. And again, it's difficult to maintain. So once we've completed the two flood alleviation structures and they're, they're up and running, the river will be diverted through here along under the new culvert that we've installed under the, the ford and back to the river ash at this location. So I hope you see that we, we are making very good progress on the scheme and that, that was a, again a hopefully a short introduction to bring you up to speed with where we are. And I'm now going to hand over to Rob Sutton from Cotswold Archaeology to take us through the archaeological elements of the scheme. Hello there, my name is Rob Sutton and I work for Cotswold Archaeology and this is a short presentation about the A120 Little Hand Bypass and Flood Alleviation Scheme and the archaeological discoveries, the stories so far. In the summer of 2019, a large excavation to place in advance of construction. And over the next 30 or so minutes, I'm going to talk to you about how we found ourselves 
working on site and what we found. I've been an archaeologist for a little over 20 years. I'm just going to be sharing some of those discoveries with you today from my dining room table. Uh, excuse the rather curious background noise as children walk to school and cars drive past in the pouring rain this morning. Uh, but hopefully you can uh, follow my words and follow the pictures on the screen too. It's a little bit of context for you. Little Haddon in Hertfordshire. You can see marked on this Google Earth image. The large urban conurbation to the east there is the town of Bishop Stortford. You can see the M11 motorway running to the east. Thanks again for this image. As we can see, the construction works in operation a few months after the start on site. And you can see the topsoil has been stripped and you can follow the outline of the bypass as it sweeps through the countryside to the north of the village. So, what are we going to talk to you about today? I'm going to talk to you about different coloured mud, because that's what archaeology is all about at the end of the day, isn't it? Different coloured mud. This rather abstract image is from a drone taking an aerial shot of one of the archaeological excavations in process. If you look closely, you can just about make out the archaeologists there. It's uh, quite a high shot, quite a large scale. There's little white dots of small buckets. And the slightly yellow looking ones are the archaeologists on site. But it's not. Or maybe it is just about different coloured mud. Sometimes that different coloured mud starts to take shape in the landscape and we start to interpret what that is being remains from several thousand years ago. But I know you probably want to hear about dead Romans too. We're going to be talking about them. And a little about the Romans that found them. That's a cheap shot. My two colleagues here are Italian and not from Rome at all actually. But we will be talking about some of the human remains we found on site too. And of course, what they left behind for us. Let's go back to a contextual shot here. So, 2016, back at the start of the project, when we were first developing the design for the bypass and the flood alleviation scheme, we started to explore the potential for archaeological remains on site through death-based assessment and research. This helped us recognise that there was some background potential for archaeological remains through discoveries that had been found in and around the neighbourhood. Um, but we needed to follow this up with further investigations. You can see the outline of the scheme footprint there in orange. So to support the death-based assessment work, we undertook some geophysical surveys. Because the death space assessment only tells you so much. The geophysical survey technique we employed was called magnetometry. And this gives us a sneak peek at what must survive beneath the ground. The survey results offer us up these different shades of grey, so rather abstract images, but you can see the different shades of grey well, those different shades of grey are reported as buried archaeological remains. Uh, disturbances and differences in the magnetic background of buried remains gives us these results. If we go back to this image again, you can see these tiny little green lines, bluey green lines. Well, they are the locations of trial trenches. And in 2016 and 17, uh, we undertook an excavation of about 30 trial trenches along the length of the scheme. And these trial trenches, as you can see from this photo here, are about two metres wide and about 30 metres long. And we use those to explore some of the features that we've identified either in the death-based assessment or via the geophysical survey. 
In this case, there were some anomalies, some disturbances in the magnetic uh, background that were identified in the geophysical survey. We went back to explore to see whether these are buried archaeological remains. Yeah, back to different coloured mud again, as you can see in the shot here. Well, what those trial trenches revealed was that we did have locale of buried archaeological remains along the footprint of the scheme. Specifically, there were four locations which we decided to go back to to do a set piece archaeological excavation in advance of construction. And that's what took place in 2019. And that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Well, here we can see one of those areas where archaeological excavations were to take place. And this was in the summer of 2019. Quite large areas where the archaeological excavations were to take place. And as you can see here, we're removing the topsoil and the plough soil with heavy machinery. Those upper layers have been churned over and turned over by the plough for several thousand years. And there aren't any buried archaeological remains surviving with them in this case. The buried archaeology survives below. Now there may well be some artifacts that have been churned up and survived within the topsoil. We check some of that topsoil too. But ultimately we use this heavy machinery to remove carefully, but carefully remove the topsoil and plough soil to reveal what is beneath. Go back to one of those images I showed you earlier. Here we can see the topsoil has been removed in its entirety across the length of the footprint of the scheme. To the south, you can see the field undisturbed and to the north, you can see where the vehicles were running during the construction operations. There's a hall road running there. And in between, we've got about 30 meters wide corridor of where the topsoil has been stripped. And what's revealed beneath is the buried archeological remains. A slightly less abstract image now down at the ground and we can see what we're dealing with here. We've got a partially excavated infield former ditch or a field boundary. Um, through the excavations we identified some uh, diagnostic pieces of pottery that I, were, I, were able to um, date this feature or at least when it started to be backfilled and go out of use as a ditch, as a field boundary in the landscape. And here we have many cross cutting infield ditch and pit features. And the archaeologists are able to tease apart the relationship between these features and start understanding how the landscape evolved and changed through these excavations. And you can see small slots have been excavated through the buried infield ditches, we can phase the different periods of activity on site. We can see when one ditch has gone out of use, has been backfilled, and another ditch or pit feature or other excavated feature, cut feature, has cut through it. Sometimes these features take on more interesting forms, and what we have here is the partially excavated eaves drip gully from an Iron Age roundhouse, a 2000 year old roundhouse. I use that word eaves drip gully just now and we can see it in the context of this nice simple reconstruction of an Iron Age roundhouse. The gully that runs around the outside, that's where the rainwater would shed off the, the, the thatched roofing and keep the inhabitants inside and outside as well, relatively dry by taking the water into that gully. Some of the features we found on site were not so easy to interpret, but following the immediate removal of topsoil and plough soil by the machine. And here's a really interesting one. What we have here is a compact chalky material. Now, actually in this area more in generally um, but also actually we actually found a few of these little locations across where we were stripping the topsoil too you do get geological erratics you do get little patches of curious geology which are actually just natural occurrences but this one had straight edges not normally a natural occurrence so this required further exploration to see if we could reveal 
what it might be. You can start seeing now as the archaeological excavations began to tease out the material that we discovered on site, a shape started to appear. As we were able to identify rubble and backfill and demolition debris from foundations and wall material, it started to take shape. Here we can see our archaeologists teasing away some of that rubble and backfill to reveal the feature. And here we have it, an 1800 year old corn dryer. So here we have our nearly 2000 year old building or well, the foundations of it anyway, what's left, what's survived the last 1800 years. It's a Roman period corn dryer. At the top of this image, you can see the excavated hole of the fire pit that was cre would have created the heat to be drawn into the flue, a form of underfloor heating, if you like. The harvest material, the corn, etc., that's come from the field, on top. Well, let me explain that a little bit better with this 2000 year old grainy photo. Pun intended, obviously. This helps us understand from what we've found on site how it would have worked in reality. This is a photo from the 1970s of a reconstruction of a corn dryer. Relatively similar to the one that we found. If you look just in the foreground there, you can see the fire pit, the slightly off center. Go back and look at ours in a moment. You'll notice ours was central. But what you can understand from this is the scale of the structure, what would have survived above ground 2000 years ago, and obviously the context of the material we found too. Just to help you understand a little bit more about how it worked, here you can see it during the reconstruction, during the creation of that original building. We can see the floor layer with the flute underneath where the heat would have been drawn and on top of that floor would have been where the grain would have been stored to allow it to dry. Coming back to our corn dryer again, archaeology is a destructive process. We excavated not only the rubble and the debris around the walls, but we started to unpick the very construction of the walls itself and the foundations to help us understand how it was built, but also recognise that actually on several occasions the walls had been repaired. There'd been um, patches had been put back together after damage had occurred. Um, so it, we get an understanding that in this case this building would have been looked after, it had been maintained, it would have been an important structure within the landscape, an important structure to the community, potentially being used for several decades, maybe even longer. Here we can see how the ground has been charred and burnt from the heat of the fire that would have drawn the heat through the flue to dry the material that was harvested. Again, a further image of the way in which we work on site, peeling back the layers. But of course, the structure itself only tells us so much. If we look on the left hand side of this photo, we can see those white buckets. Well, in those white buckets, we've collected some of the soil that we found within the flues, some of that darker earth that you see in the photo in front of you now. Well, within that earth, within those soils, which we take back to the lab for processing, we we're able to identify the charred plant remains that would have been dried within this corn dryer. This material, wheat, helps us understand more about how the landscape was being farmed and what people were eating. 2000 years ago, nearly 2000 years ago. And it's then we move to the people. I spoke a little bit about some of the features we found on site. By features, I mean some of the uh, 
way in which the landscape was being chopped up and divided, the way in which some of the houses would be occupied, and of course that interesting corn drive feature. But it all belongs to people. And in this case, we actually found not just the rubbish that they'd left behind and the artifacts that we find, but the people themselves too. Across all of our excavations, we found 18 cremation burials. Found in a relatively compact area, only about 30 or 40 metres away from that corn dryer I was talking about earlier. Here you can make out mid excavation, the remains of four urns, each one containing human cremation, buried about 19 years ago. Sorry for the poor quality of this image, but it's another example of a cremation burial. In this case, the human remains were buried underneath a broken plate. Again, about 1900 years ago. You'll recall from the four urn image I showed two shots ago, well, that was actually block lifted. It's an archaeological technique which involves us taking up large parts of an archaeological discovery and bringing it back to the lab for investigation and excavation in a much better surroundings. So we can really tease out some of the stories and in this case carefully remove the human remains, the cremated remains within the urns. Those examples I showed you survived quite well. They were buried deep enough so that the plough over the last 100, 200, maybe a thousand years didn't disturb too many of the pots themselves. But we also had examples where the urns were quite badly truncated, had been broken and the tops chopped off through centuries of ploughing. In these examples, you can see just the bases of the pot survive with the charred human remains, still mostly in situ. We didn't just have cremations. We had four inhumation burials too. Found roughly in the same place as the um, as most of the uh, cremations. So in effect, we had a cemetery of a sort, not too far away from where the corn dryer was found, and in the wider landscape of what seems to be occupation and farmland too. These burials have been provisionally dated to about 1800 years ago, so about the same phase as those cremations. So we've got two different types of burials taking place in broadly the same time period. Some of the burials were in better condition than other ones. But in this example here, you can see that unfortunately the burial has been truncated, has been chopped, has been cut by a later, still Roman, field boundary. So as archeologists are teasing the different phasing of the site, here we can recognize that the cemetery, although seemingly in use for several hundred years, had perhaps disappeared within the landscape. There weren't many identifications or gravestones, etc., that would help us recognise and understand where it was in the landscape. And as a result, about 1700 years ago, 1600 years ago, a ditch, a new field boundary, was cut through the location of that cemetery. And in this case, chopping straight through the grave. We've got an example of some of the remains that were found on site in reasonable condition, but as you can see, the middle part of the skeleton has been 
removed by later Roman activity. The case of the last grave is quite deeply buried, quite deep cut grave cut. So it survived the plough. This one, less so. As you can see, actually, unfortunately, part of the leg has been lost due to probable ploughing activity over the last few hundred years. But what we are able to do is, especially with those skeletons, especially with those human remains, which have good level of survival, is explore a little bit more about who they were and what they were doing when they were living in this part of Hertfordshire 1700 years ago. We know we have uh, three men, three males and one female amongst the four burials that we found. And the level of survival of bone will also help us understand more about pathologies as well. Any diseases that these individuals may have had. Arthritis, for instance. So let's move on to some of the more pretty things we found on site. I'm going to go to my notes now to make sure I've got all of the dates right about these Roman coins, etc. In all, we found 72 coins, all bronze, most of them in quite good condition. I've got some photos here of some of the nicer ones we found. What's particularly interesting about the coins we found, most were found in a relatively small part of the site within what seems to be a shallow pond. We don't know if these have been thrown in as some kind of votive offering, flicking in a lucky coin, making a wish, but we did find them all in a pretty compact area. Interestingly also, they all date to a very narrow time period. They all date to within, apart from one or two other ones, 70 or so of them, date to between AD 330 and AD 360. Very short time period. Um, that's the time period of the House of Constantine, Constantine the first, second and third, the Roman emperors. And here we have a bronze numerous coin of Constantine the second. This is from about 330 to 335 AD. We have another one, similar type coin again. This is commemorating the glory of Rome and the founding of Constantinople. On the reverse, on the right hand side there, you can see the rather familiar image of Romulus and Remus and the wolf too. Another bronze numerous coin here, depicting the Empress Helena, Helena, from about AD 337. Another coin again, with some nice detail, in the House of Constantine again. Potentially, because of the quality of it, actually a copy of an original coin. And another interesting coin here. Bronze numerous coin, Magnentius, depicted on this coin. Some of the other small finds we recovered from site. We have here a boss on bow brooch, late Iron Age copper alloy brooch. You can see from the scale that's about seven or eight centimeters long small piece metalwork this is late iron age so this is about 2100 years old about 100 bc this pretty little object is a broken part of a shale bracelet a little bit later in the roman period this one potentially into the late third or fourth century a.d about 280 to 400 AD. Oh, it'll take you forward another thousand years now. This is a medieval iron 
crescent headed arrowhead probably about 1580 about 500 years old no context with this just a stray find that we identified on site one of my favorite pieces that we found on site this one this is a jet bead probably again from the roman period probably manufactured and made in north yorkshire up in whitby where a lot of the jet that we find in england wales and scotland would have been manufactured even from back in the roman period And here we have a splinter of a bone sharpened to the point and polished from use probably. It would have probably been used as a piercing or an awl to make holes in leather and material. This one is one of the older finds that we've had off site. This is about a thousand BC. It could be about three thousand to two and a half thousand years old. chance to talk to you a little bit about some of the pottery we found on site too. 10,000 shirts we recovered from a variety of different contexts in fields of ditches and rubbish pits in and around in this case of the rubble in the backfield next to the corn dryer. Some of them also in intentional deposits like the urns and the plates on the cremation barrels. Here's an image of some of the pieces we recovered during the excavations. Let's work our way through the time periods. Some of the earliest pottery we found on site is some of this handmade flint tempered ware. This is uh, late Bronze Age to early Iron Age, the same time period as that worked piece of bone, that all that piercing tool I mentioned. This is about 1000 to 600 BC, late Bronze Age to early Iron Age. We have some middle to late Iron Age. This is about 300 BC, 2300 years ago. This is some handmade quartz tempered pottery. Tempered being, you can see within the clay, those tiny little specks of quartz, which help bring strength to the pottery during the firing process. We've got some early Roman pottery here. This is grog tempered wear gel with a combed shoulder. Early Roman period about 50 to 150 AD, about 1900 years old, comb decorated, obviously, as you can tell from the decorations that have been made by a comb, exactly what it says on the tin. Got another piece of uh, grub tempered greyware, this is from a large storage jar, the rim of a large storage jar. Here we have an interesting piece of pottery. This is a Samian ware, Samian ware dish, which had been intentionally perforated. That hole was made intentionally before it was used as part of one of those cremation urn burials I was showing you earlier. In effect, the pot was being killed. It was, it was dead, like the inhabitants of the urn and the cremation too. A very intentional act. Here we have another image of some Samian ware. This is uh, from Southern Gaul, which is uh, modern day France. Um, and in this case, we can actually see the maker's stamp. If you just look on the left image there, you can make out the words Patrici, Patrick, if you want to call him that, Patrici from um, Patricius from um, not too far away from Toulouse, about 100 miles from Toulouse, South France. 
some more fine central and eastern Gaulish Samian ware. Part of a dish on the left there, part of a flagon on the right. This is about 150 to 200 AD, about 1800 years old. This is one of those fine grey ware platters from another cremation burial that I mentioned before. One of those broken plates that would have been laid over the top of a cremation. Again, about 50 to 70 AD, 1950 years ago. Very nice piece of uh, black slip ware pottery here. Middle Roman period, about 200 AD, about 1800 years old. Mosul Keramic, I believe is my missing pronunciation of it. Mosul Keramic type ware. Black slip ware. So, let me have a quick run through of some of the finer discoveries we found on site, some of the artifacts. So where do these discoveries and artifacts lead us? Well, we're starting to piece together a story of how the landscape or this part of Hertfordshire was farmed and occupied and how this changed during the late Iron Age about 2000 years ago, how it changed throughout the Roman period, the three or 400 years that followed. We've got more research to do and how some of these teasers that I didn't mention actually, do you know what, let's touch upon a few of those. We found some window glass. We found some Roman window glass in that dark blob feature you see in front of us. That's the pond where we found a lot of the um, coins from, shallow pond. We found a small piece of window glass window glass, very fragile, doesn't travel very far, and it's also a good indication of a rather high status dwelling or building nearby. So that's a tenuous little story there starting to reveal itself. If we're in the agricultural hinterland, if we're in the farmed landscape nearby to a high status dwelling, perhaps. More research required on that one too. What I've really spoke about is just a snapshot into some of the discoveries that we found on site in the summer of 2019. The research is ongoing and in the link below in the description you'll see uh, we've set up a dedicated web page which explores some more of the things I've been speaking about um, and you can learn more about some of the discoveries on site. We'll be updating that web page in the forthcoming months too. Thank you for watching. Uh, click subscribe to get notifications on more videos and content. See, before I go any further, special thanks to a few people that worked on the project. Um, special thanks to Graham uh, Construction, who we work with very closely on this project. Um, they're excellent. Um, I'll say that about many of my clients I work with, but they were particularly good. It's not easy trying to build a, a new road um, with 30, 40 archaeologists um, often getting in the way. Um, but they were excellent um, and special thanks to Seamus and his team. Also thanks to Alison Tinswood at Hertfordshire County Council for her support and direction and to Jim Carter Arab as well, advising the client on the archaeological strategy and uh, a really successful team. And we'll be working together as the post excavation stages develop over the next few months too. I'm Rob Sutton, thank you very much.